Welcome to Securing America with me, Frank Gaffney, the program that's a kind of owner's manual for protecting the country we love against all enemies, foreign and domestic, to God's glory and that of his kingdom. We talk about China a lot here, and a man who I think brings some fresh thought, practically daily, to the topic of China, of what it is up to, what the Chinese Communist Party intends to do to us, and what we had best be doing about all of that uh, is our first guest. His name is Dr. Bradley Thayer. He is a founding member of our Committee on the Present Danger China. He is an author of numerous books, um, including a forthcoming one, I'm pleased to say. The most recent of them, I think, is How China Sees the World, Han Centrism, and the balance of power in international politics. And we're going to talk with him a bit about that Han centrism business. Uh, Brad Thayer, it's always good to have you with us. Welcome back. Thank you, Frank. It's a, my great pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Let me ask you about this phenomenon. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party has, uh, I think, a persistent question of its legitimacy. It's done horrific things to its people over the course of its uh, domination of them. Uh, it has been, of course, uh, somewhat successful, I think, frankly, thanks to financing from us in no small measure in lifting many of them out of poverty. But You've written recently, uh, I think at Epic Times, about this question of whether or not the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, is determined to maintain its legitimacy and its control of its people by appealing to this sort of Han culture, civilization, well, centrism, supremacism, perhaps, if you wish. Talk a bit about that, if you would. Thank you, Frank. Um, this is an extremely important issue because the Chinese Communist Party is illegitimate uh, as a, a governing force, as a polity. Um, the Chinese Communist Party is uh, adopting a Western ideology, not a Chinese ideology, but a Western ideology of Marxism, Leninism, um, Stalinism uh, through Mao. Um, to oppress the Chinese people and to export that odious ideology uh, around the world. Um, and so um, we need to recognize first uh, that the Chinese Communist Party is adopting a non-Chinese ideology, a Western ideology, uh, to oppress the Chinese people. It also works to... Um, buttress uh, the fact that it is illegitimate by making the appeals to the greatness of Chinese civilization, of Han civilization, uh, for many thousand years. One of the world's greatest civilizations, of course, with fundamental contributions in technology, science, uh, literature, art, philosophy, religion, um, which is uh, innate, obviously, uh, to China. The illegitimate Chinese Communist Party seeks to seize that and make appeals to it to, in fact, um, become Chinese when, in fact, it is not a Chinese entity. Uh, yeah, when we recognize that its ideology uh, is Marxism as interpreted by Lenin, Stalin, uh, and Mao. Mm -hmm. So it is fundamentally not Chinese and is fundamentally illegitimate. You know, I, I'm so interested in this uh, because I was uh, involved, as you know, in a small way with uh, President Reagan in his efforts to contend with and ultimately to defeat the last of those communist Marxist um, totalitarian states that sought the destruction of this country, namely the Soviet Union. And a key part of his strategy um, which he insinuated into uh, his speeches and his policy making uh, in any number of ways was this idea of delegitimating the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, uh, the the evil empire, the the very uh, odious and oppressive manifestation of communism in its day, as you say, both inside the USSR, uh, 
elsewhere in the uh, the Warsaw Pact. It controlled, and then wherever possible into other countries beyond. Uh, to the extent that that was in fact uh, a key element of his successful strategy, Ronald Reagan's. Brad, uh, are there lessons to be learned about what we should be doing to help delegitimate the Chinese Communist Party in this moment? Uh, absolutely, Frank. As, as uh, you worked within the Reagan administration for many years, and you were really on the um, front line uh, of those struggles, uh, what the Reagan administration did, as you well know, is that they refused to recognize the legitimacy of the Soviet Union. Uh, recognizing that it was an oppressive and evil force, as he famously identified in his March 1983 speech, a very important speech which inspired so many people in the yes. Soviet Union. Uh, Anatoly Sharansky, of course, has written uh, after Reagan's death about how that speech inspired him, that he recognized that the lies were over, Leninism was dead, and here you had a Western leader speaking the truth about the Soviet Union. So for those in the gulag, it was inspiring. Um, and we need to yes. keep that in mind, that, that similarly, there are so many oppressed within China. We need leadership that will call attention to the fact that the regime is Ill the Chinese regime is illegitimate, uh, to sustain that message over time, to enlist our friends, allies, like-minded people around the world uh, in that effort. Uh, and to inspire the Chinese people uh, so that they can uh, recognize the rest of the world is there to assist them, is sympathetic and is there to assist them uh, working to overthrow uh, the Chinese Communist Party, this illegitimate polity, um, as uh, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was delegitimized uh, ultimately uh, and overthrown. We need right. to work from within China as well as bloodlessly, outside China. we might add. I'm, I'm yeah, sorry. Indeed. Bloodlessly, we might add as well, thank God. Um, let me ask you about uh, a movement that I've learned a bit about lately, uh, Brad Thayer, that contributes, I think, to this uh, effort to delegitimate the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, it's something called Tui Dong, and it has at its core, the idea of facilitating public renunciation is usually anonymous, though, uh, of course, given what the party would do to anybody who does this openly. But um, people professing, they no longer want to have anything to do with the CCP. Um, tell us a little bit about this movement and whether this is um, a force to be, you know, uh, worked with to that shared purpose of trying to liberate the people of China from the predations of this odious totalitarian communist system. Frank, it's a significant movement uh, that, if you will, twists the, the uh, dragon's tail uh, of, um, of uh, the Ch uh, Chinese Communist Party. Uh, we need to recognize that there are many movements, religious movements within China, uh, political movements, elements in civil society, uh, which do not accept the legitimacy of the party and within their tight constraints uh, are expressing their uh, loathing of the regime and a desire to uh, uh, eliminate it. So mm -hmm. we can see throughout China there are movements like this, which as you well note um, are, of, um, are extremely brave given the fact that uh, the Chinese regime very actively suppresses uh, and Indeed. punishes those uh, who are uh, seen as uh, malcontents or essentially yeah. ideological enemies. And yet, I, I'm, I'm told that there is something on the order of three to four hundred million people who have uh, lent their names or their pseudonyms, at least, to this Tuidong movement. So there's something there, that's for sure. We have to take a quick break. We're going to come right back with more with Dr. Bradley Thayer on the other side of a short break. Stay tuned. 